The 20th and 21st centuries have been dubbed the plastics age, such as the influence and reach of this family of materials. We clean our teeth with plastic toothbrushes, type on plastic keyboards, drink and eat from plastic packaging. It's impossible to go through a day without encountering plastic of some kind. 14% of all plastic is said to be recycled, but in fact only 2% is truly circular. 32% makes its way into nature, ending up as microplastics or nanoplastics, which pollute our oceans, air and bodies. It's this fugitive plastic that Neil Dunn has set his sights on. He's CEO of Polymateria, the startup behind a new biodegradable plastic. Since the 1950s, the mass production of plastic has led to billions of tonnes of waste. Every year, almost a third of all plastic made ends up in the natural environment, and it can stay there for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. It's a real problem. I've come to Imperial College in White City to meet a startup who claim to have found a solution. So we have a problem with plastic. We create a lot of it, and we don't really recycle enough of it. How are you addressing those issues? Firstly, by focusing in on pure materials, so materials that do have a chance of returning to nature, but redesigning them at point of manufacture. So the three things that we do to change those materials fundamentally are, um, firstly, understanding how you destroy the hard crystalline part of the plastic structure. That's really important, because if you don't do that, you create microplastic, and that's why other attempts have failed. You then, to everyday people like me and you, create a wax or a grease. That's what it feels like in the kind of the, the early stage. You have to make that grease or wax attractive to nature. So the second thing we do is we add a prebiotic aspect so that what is a carbon or a wax, microbes, fungi and bacteria see that as attractive and they attack it and assimilate it and that's how you get full biodegradation. Okay, so I get it now. The penny's <laughs> dropped. Um, you are addressing a problem where you know that the plastic will eventually end up in nature and you're saying, okay, we know it's gonna end up being fugitive let's address that problem. Exactly. So does all of that science happen here? Everything happens right underneath our feet, so why don't we go see them now? Polymateria are initially targeting polyolefins, which are the types of plastic that most likely end up in nature. Polyolefins include polyethylene, which is used to make plastic bags and packaging, and polypropylene, used to make plastic cups, cutlery, bottle caps and food containers. I'm about to meet Florence Wynne, a biochemist that's helped to develop Polymateria's novel plastic and see exactly how it works. Hi Florence. Oh, hello Shani. Let me just grab your lab coat. How are we for masks? As long as we're socially distanced, then we can take it off. Okay. Wow. So what do we have here? So here you have a film uh, without our technology. Okay, um, so this is the typical plastic that we all use today? Yes, exactly. So here you have microplastics. Okay, so this is what typically happens when the plastics that we've all been using break down in the environment. Yes, exactly. And, that's, and then that ends up in the river and then finally in the ocean. The polymateria technology uses a commercially sensitive additive containing around a dozen different components, including oils, rubbers and desiccants or drying agents, which is mixed in with conventional polymers at the manufacturing stage of plastic packaging. So why is your material different? So when uh, a plastic containing our technology ends up in the natural environment, it will be converted into a wax that is bioavailable. I love that word, bioavailable. Okay. I don't know, it just sounds so well, good it's, for the environment. Yes, well it is. So, uh, so why is it good? Because plastic comes from hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. Why is it good that this material is available? What the, the technology does is that it breaks down those very long chain of molecules into a very shorter chain of molecules um, that also have specific chemical functions on it that are called carbonyl functions and that what makes um, microbes recognize it as a food source. 
Wow. Okay, so you're saying that plastic can actually be food for organisms. Yes, exactly. Before we find out how plastic can become a harmless food source, we need to know how it's made. It starts with crude oil, which contains long-chain hydrocarbon molecules. When distilled in a refinery, the oil is separated into fractions, which are a mixture of hydrocarbon chains. One of these fractions, naphtha, is the crucial compound used in plastics. Its long chains are diluted with steam and briefly heated in a hot furnace to crack the chains into smaller molecules. A catalyst is added that links the molecules together to form polymers called resins. These are shaped into pre-production pellets known as nurdles and transported to manufacturers. The nurdles are then heated and moulded into different types of plastic products. It's during this process the commercially sensitive polymaterial additive is introduced. In the presence of light, air and moisture, it breaks the hard crystalline structure into a wax-like substance of short-chain molecules containing carbon atoms double-bonded to an oxygen atom. These are called carbonyl functions, and microbes latch onto these double bonds, converting the wax into food, carbon dioxide and water, leaving no microplastics behind. They're calling the process biotransformation. What I want to see is the actual weathering machine, because the idea that you can squash three months of environmental kind of conditions into 14 days sounds fascinating. They're just here at the back. We have plenty here to uh, do our testing. Um, here you have just one that uh, finished. Here you have a film that doesn't have our technology and here you have a film that has our technology in. So you can feel and touch it. Very brittle. Yes. So this is what actual plastic does today. It just stays the way it's always been. Yes, exactly. Whereas your material is visibly different. It looks like it's just flaking into, it's a bit like rice paper. Because it's not a plastic anymore um, and it got converted into a wax. Um, we do some fancy chemical analysis of, of that to make sure it, it is actually a wax. So is there a place where we can actually see the analysis that you do? Yes, of course, I'll take you to the analysis lab. So let's go. We make sure this is a wax by analysing how long the molecules are and also uh, make, make sure that we have those carbonyl functions essential uh, for microbes to recognise it as a food source. So we've placed the material here on this machine um, and then we'll just run an analysis. So here you can see a huge peak here and that means that our wax has a lot of those carbonyl functions. What's this? So this is a label we put um, on our products um, and that just shows customers that they can recycle our product. Polymaterial material products will have a use-by date printed on them, or rather, a recycle-by date. Through their weathering experiments, they've worked out how much additive is needed to set exactly when the catalyst kicks in to start breaking down the material, allowing manufacturers to tailor it for their product, depending on the required lifespan. After the recycle by date, the product no longer behaves like a plastic. Florence demonstrates by attempting to recycle both conventional plastic and their product after it's been weathered. So this is what recycled plastic looks like. Yes, now if uh, we look at what's been weathered outdoors, and we try to do the same, exact same thing. This is poly, poly yes. material now. Okay, I can just redo. So this is, what we're about to see is an attempt to recycle polymaterial. Uh, yes, uh, an attempt to recycle it after it spent some time outdoors. What we should see is that uh, we can't recycle it back into that piece of plastic because it's not a plastic anymore. So here, you there's just see there. there's nothing there um, because you see it's just a bit liquid wax. It's very hard to imagine that it won't leave some trace. So the wax itself, when it's at that stage, is not toxic at all 
um, to, to, to the organisms we've tested. We've tested you know, the main ones to represent uh, the aquatic environment and the terrestrial environment. So we've tested earthworm, daphnias. We've also tested if they had any impact on germinations of seed. Um, and then we went on also uh, testing that wax for biodegradation. So we made sure that wax would be consumed by microbes and be converted into CO2 um, and that we would leave no, uh, no wax behind. So far, there's been a lot of interest from brands that would like to make their products more environmentally friendly. And with just 20 companies responsible for producing 55% of the world's single-use plastic, they hope to cut through the greenwash and make real change by introducing polymateria technology to a wide range of product manufacturing pipelines. Unlike climate change, where we have 10 to 15 years of policy, innovation, capital, all kind of pulling in the same direction on plastic pollution, it was only in 2017 that David Attenborough really raised awareness on, on this issue and created almost a populist response to it. And there's been a lot of, yes, awareness on the, on the problem itself, but innovation on plastic pollution is not yet at the stage of maturity that maybe we have on, on climate change. So it's just a question of time.